I'd like to welcome everybody to our candidates forum tonight. We're really pleased that we do have three of our candidates, but one seems to be in the building someplace, but we're going to go ahead and get started. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Eleanor Yick, and I'm president of the League of Women Voters this year. And we're really pleased that we have candidates who are willing to come to our forums so that our citizens can become informed before they go into the voting booth. So we are tonight hearing from candidates running for congressional district number 18. But before we begin our actual program, we're going to have our voter services director, uh, Josie Geisen, come up here for just one moment, and she's going to be highlighting some information for you. Josie? As you know, we have a new system. As you know, we have a new system. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, the top two Open Primary Act, which was enacted in June of 2010, June 8th, uh, known as Prop 14. Known as Prop 14. Uh, now, it sounds formidable, and I was concerned. However, the Registrar of Voters put this nice little chart out. And on the left, when there's plenty of these out in the foyer on our uh, League of Women voter table with, please take them. Uh, the left is the presidential, the right is local, they are not involved. The center is the voter nominated top two open primary. And those include the state senator, state assembly, U.S. senator, and U.S. representative. And that's it. They will go on the top two of the voter nominated contest to November, where there'll be a runoff. And then uh, we have other material out there. Easy Voter Guide is very important. Pros and cons. We also have the uh, propositions 28 and 29. Okay, thank you. Okay, and now I'd like to introduce our moderator tonight who is going to be going over reviewing the procedures that we're going to be following and then we'll be ready to get started. So I'd like to introduce our league member Marlene Duffin. Thank you. On behalf of the League of Women Voters, Southwest Santa Clara Valley, I welcome you to our candidates forum for those running for Congress District 18. Uh, my name is Marlene Duffin and I am your moderator. And if any more come, we'll <laughs> repeat some of this. Um, candidate forums are part of the League's voter service to educate and inform voters of their choices. The League has been educating voters since its founding in 1920. And if you wish to have more information on these candidates or registration uh, blanks or other materials, we have two tables out in the lobby. So please pick up information so you can become a better educated voter. There's both, as I said, legal literature, voter registration, and also this wonderful bookmark. It's from smartvoter.org. And it really is helpful. You could type in your name and somehow magically it knows right on the computer here what district you live in, who you, who you can vote for, and where you're going to vote, your polling place. So please take home a smart voter. Yes, yeah, well, okay. Information on the candidates, yes. That's certainly an important part of it. Uh, the League of Women Voters, including smartvoter.com, uh, does not endorse candidates or political parties at any time. So let's begin the form. First of all, I want to tell you how grateful we are to you as part of our community for being candidates who are willing to give up your time and energies to seek this position. Uh, the candidates will first introduce themselves. They've already drawn numbers for their speaking orders. The candidates will uh, limit their introductory remarks to about an 
one minute and a half exactly. And at that moment. You told me two minutes. <laughs> Oh, this is a minute and a half. You're going to get two minutes now if that's... Well, they just increased it to two minutes. All right, two minutes. And Marge Bunyard is tonight's timer, and she is tough. So, yeah, well, it is, but she will give you... Show them the one-minute one, so it's... One minute and 30 seconds. I even have 15 seconds. Yeah, and really... Sure, she gets, you get more and more nervous, so... Then. <laughs> Okay, you'll notice there are some people supposed to be on either side of the room. They will be on either side of the room when you start to speak and people have questions. And they're sitting here right now, but they will wave. They're the sorters. Oh, they're the sorters. Where are my card people? Right here. here. Okay. I don't know. Hopefully, yes, but on either side of the room, they're supposed to be. One will magically appear on this side of the room, and then we've got one there. So the goal here is as you are listening and you hear a question that you would like to have an answer, please jot down the name, write the question, and at that point, it will go to our sorters who are sitting there, and from there, uh, they will give it to me to ask. We will read the question. If it's specifically targeted to either of you, uh, I will then ask the other person to uh, give a response if they so choose. Sometimes questions can be answered by, you know, one, and that's enough. They have cards. They have cards, and they're now debating. Yes. You know, this is a league event. It's very efficient. Just wait for the wait for the cards here. Um, Anyway, be sure and uh, address them correctly to a candidate, and then you will hand them back to them. Now, th the actual, uh, we got another question, or you want, you want cards back there? Uh, this should last a little over an hour. It'll just depend on how exciting your questions are. But, <laughs> but no matter what, at some point, it's over with. And at that time, each of the candidates will be allowed one minute to conclude their, uh, with a summary statement. And they'll speak in the reverse order of their introduction. So we can do that one, two, and then two, one. No, you're supposed to say yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. So at this point, then, I would ask uh, Carol if you would introduce yourself, please, and we'll start your two minutes. I'm Carol Bruyer. 20 years ago, after learning about the CIA's role in overthrowing governments and torturing innocent people, I felt a deep sense of responsibility and outrage, which prompted two decades of activism. I believe in satyagraha, which literally means truth force, and that a widespread nonviolent movement can redesign or replace the institutions that have failed us. People are waking up. Their nonviolent solidarity scares the government, which has passed legislation allowing them to torture, render, and execute anyone anywhere whom they des designate to be a threat. We've seen the government lie about basic facts, issues that threaten people's health and lives, to serve the bottom line, sacrificing people for profits. Congress holds great power, yet it has abdicated that power and allowed the rich to buy judges, the presidency, legislation, funneling money and resources to the few and threatening the many. I'm running to champion people power over corporate power, to redirect our vast resources away from imperial wars towards meeting human needs, to redesign our monetary system so that it's fair, honest, democratic, and accountable, and serves rather than enslaves people. I'm running to stand up to the oil, nuclear, pharmaceutical, insurance industries that threaten us. I'm running because I love life, my family, my children. We can trump the corporate forces, fear, greed, the narrow pursuit of profit. We can expose the lies that veil the dominant institutions. We can dismantle empires, recognize and respect human rights, realizing that re legitimate governments serve all their people. Okay, do you like William or do you like Bill? Uh, either one. William would be fine. Okay, William. So my name is William Parks, and uh, I'm a registered Democrat. I'm, I'm running as a Democrat, and I'm running against an incumbent who I've probably voted for eight times. Now, 
I've always been a liberal, I've always been a progressive, and that hasn't changed, that's my position on the issues. But over time, I've realized my loyalty to the Democratic pro uh, Party has probably become part of the problem. Right now, I feel like Washington, D.C. is completely controlled by special interests, and the incumbents, who have become very good at getting reelected, are catering to special interests and ignoring the voters, taking the voters for granted. So we need to change that in order to change the direction of this country. Over the past 20 years, when I came here as a semiconductor engineer, um, I noticed it was getting worse and worse and jobs were leaving the country. Um, and then after about five years, I went, uh, I, became, I became an attorney, I went to night school, became an attorney, started practicing law, and over about the last eight years, I've been a bankruptcy attorney. And I've watched it go from bad to worse. And the situation has gotten really bad for the taxpayer, and we must do something about this. And I believe we need to impose term limits on our congressmen. I think this needs to be done at the primary level so we don't have to have a drastic change. We can still vote for a Democrat or vote for a Republican, but change the incumbents and change Washington. Our president will now read a statement. Unfortunately, Anna Estu was not able to be here tonight, but she did send a statement that she asked to be read. So I'm going to read this statement on her behalf. Dear friends, when you're in the eye of the storm, it's difficult to get your bearings. For four years, our country has been in the grip of an economic nor'easter that is only now subsiding. Like the generations that put things right after the Great Depression and World War II, we must rebuild and restore our nation. For the economy to grow, people must first have confidence that they are personally on solid financial footing. That's why I've worked to get mortgage relief for those in danger of losing their homes, advocated for adult children to be covered by their parents' health insurance, and objected to dismantling or privatizing Medicare or Social Security. I've championed investments in alternative energy, communication technology, and transit infrastructure that will spur job growth and enhance our capacity to produce and compete. Now we should redouble our investments in education and in American workers so that our workforce is the most highly skilled and best prepared in the world. Congress must develop a plan to eliminate the deficit and balance the budget. It should be specific, achievable, and fair. Shared sacrifice is critical. We must all provide the political will to ensure follow through on the plan. We can expect only as much government as we can afford, and every project and every service must demonstrate efficiency and value. We have no room for waste. Repair work following a storm is never easy, but America is worth it. I regret that I'm unable to be here with you in person due to my voting schedule in Washington. I thank you for your understanding, and I'd be honored to have your support. Sincerely, Anna Estu. Uh, Dave? Thank you. Yeah, sorry I'm late having a... Yes. Everyone knows about the jobs problem that we have. The official government statistics are nonsense. Unemployment is probably more like 20% than like eight. I believe the jobs problem is a symptom of a larger problem. I believe that the number one national security issue today is corruption in Washington, D.C. We have a situation in this country where we allow foreign governments and foreign corporations to operate lobbying efforts inside of Washington. These lobbying efforts are thinly disguised money laundering operations whose purpose is to funnel foreign money into the pockets of our elected officials. We have a $500 billion a year trade deficit right now. That is to say, 5 million Americans are out of work because of our trade policies. Who benefits from this? Foreign governments, obviously, foreign companies, but also the multinational corporations. It's no coincidence that people like General Electric 
people, yes, <laughs> are paying zero taxes. Yeah, you laugh, but that's who the Congress really represents. The level of corruption extends also to the issue of these guest worker programs. We have a situation today, a few weeks ago, the United States government accepted 100,000 applications for H-1B visas. These are a guest worker program that puts American college graduates out of work. And in October, they will issue another 100,000 of these things, which will bring the total to 1.2 million, and that will put another 100,000 Americans out of work. When I'm in Congress, I'll put a stop to this. Thank you very much. All right, I've got a few questions here. I'll just. How much time do they have to answer questions? Hmm? Okay. Two minutes and a half to answer any questions. Okay, the first question is, and I'll start and go one, two, three, if that's all right there, Dave, so you're <laughs> into the mix here. Um, to the empty chair. <laughs> now, the question is to all candidates, and it, it's underlined, please be specific. So, uh, what, in your opinion, is the Simpson-Bowles Commission report? Carol? I don't know. Uh, okay, we'll start with William. Well, I believe the Simpson-Bowles report was a report on how to... Uh, save Social Security with, um, with Senate, former Senator Simpson uh, on the board. If, <clears throat> hopefully I'm, I'm correct on this, which uh, has been ignored by both the House and the Senate. Okay, Dave. <laughs> well, certainly it's been ignored by everybody. Um, the the Simpson-Bowles Commission was supposed to come up with a comprehensive financial solution, and it was supposed to provide a bipartisan agenda of tax cuts and uh, cuts, I'm sorry, tax increases and service cuts, yeah. Uh, but in fact, it was a cynical ploy to uh, distract attention from the real issues, and that's why everybody's ignoring it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Done with that one. All right, this is for all <laughs> candidates, and we're gonna start with you, Dave, and go that way. What would you charge and promote in our trade, or change, change and promote in our trade policies to help our economy? <laughs> well, <laughs> um, the single biggest issue is that the U.S. dollar is overpriced, and that in turn is simply due to the manipulation of the Chinese currency and by the fact that the United States dollar is the global currency, we are going to have to sit down and think hard about how to have a global policy with regard to the U.S. dollar. This is technical banking stuff. It's very subtle. But we can't just la-di-da have $3 billion or $3 trillion or whatever gazillion dollars is floating around outside of the U.S. with no idea who really has it no regulatory authority over it, and no way of being certain whether those dollars are gonna come home to roost someday. We need to have a global banking regulatory environment to prevent the current global dollar situation from blowing up. The trade will fix itself once you've accomplished that. Thank you. William? Yes, I believe the problem with our trade policy is the problem with our country, and that's the influence of money and special interest in Washington, D.C. Again, the politicians are catering to special interest, giving them what they want, while they, they pretend to be acting on behalf of the voters of their districts. Now, we need a trade policy that is fair. Washington always promotes 
free trade, but the only thing free about it is, is it's free for other countries to import anything into this country they want. And it's not a, it's not a quid pro quo. We do not have that same uh, opportunity to compete fairly against an, an import to the other com countries. So what we need to do is we need a policy that will keep the jobs here. The recent trade treaties, going back to NAF, um, NAFTA, has hurt the American workers and cost us jobs, up to the most recent one, which would be Colombia. And I think most of the voters don't even understand why Barack Obama was in Colombia, but he was there to sign the new trade agreement, which is going to cost American jobs. Carol. Well, I think free trade is a great misnomer. Uh, it's almost like a free license to kill, a license to steal, <laughs> a license to exploit. And it's been going on for hundreds of years. Uh, what has happened, too, is we've created these transnational institutions like the World Trade Organization that are, are actually illegal entities. They weren't democratically elected. They're institutions which serve giant corporations, just as NAFTA and the Free Trade Area of the Americas that they've been trying to force down our throats have been written of, by, and for corporations. Now, um, the corporate structure, structure was actually invented to serve the needs of expanding empires to colonize entire continents. And it depends on legal fictions which degrade indigenous people to the status of terrorists, relying on military force to overcome moral and physical challenges. And I think this is really the heart of the problem, is that these governments are catering to corporations without any thought about the people who live within their boundaries. So all those trade agreements are harming people everywhere, not just here in the United States, but also in Mexico and throughout the world, where they're uh, exploiting people, stealing resources, and, it, and it's really benefiting the rich in throughout the world, not just in this country, at the, benef or at the expense of the great majority in all countries. So what we need is fair trade, not free trade. Thank you. All right, now the next question, I'm gonna start with you, William. <coughs> they want a yes or no answer, but I would assume if you wanted to say one more sentence to it, it would be fair to do that <laughs> because a yes or no doesn't really tell us very much. Um, and there's two parts to this. There are really three parts, but I've given up on the third one. Um, okay. You can only answer so much on one question. But if we have time, we'll get back to it. Would you vote for major tax reform, and would you vote for a flat tax? I would vote for tax reform, but I would not vote for a flat tax. That hurts the middle class. And I could talk for hours on this. <laughs> we need to tax the rich. Okay, and what about, okay, the flat tax you said? No, no. flat tax. All right. Okay, Dave? Well, <clears throat> I'm not a fan of the current tax system. If I had my choice, I'd go back to the 1983 tax system. So yeah, no flat tax. Okay, and would you vote for a major tax reform? I would not vote for any of the proposals currently on the table. Okay, Carol. Oh, I'm against a flat tax. It's very regressive. Um, but I do think that we could solve our problems by having monetary reform, uh, which would you know, change the situation totally. Uh, and I'd love to expound upon that if you are going to allow us to tackle the major issues that we think confront us. One or two sentences. Monetary reform meaning what? Meaning, well, Dennis Kucinich proposed H.R. 2990 last fall, and it would end the bank's license to create money. It would nationalize the Federal Reserve, enabling the government to fund itself without indebting future generations. It would create a public works program to spend $2.2 trillion into circulation to maintain our infrastructure. If new money is spent on real non-military goods and services, it will not create inflation. We have to reclaim the power to create money, money which has been privatized by the banks which have used it to buy our politicians, write policy, and dominate the country, and loot the world. 
All right, I just want to make sure you got it. Okay, here's a question. I'll give you the first part of, or the second part, and then mention just the first, because the first is a statement which we want questions, not statements. But what is your stand on universal health care with a single payer financing? And basically, it's referring to the fact that Obamacare doesn't cover everyone and um, keeps the insurance companies making huge profits. That's their opinion. But um, <laughs> let's start now with you, Dave. Yeah. Well, I, I don't think I like any of these proposals. The United States has not had an adult conversation about health reform yet. You know, we, here's, here's a couple of facts. If you're white, America has one of the best health insurance systems in the world. If you're not white, it has pretty much in the middle of the pack, better than Botswana, not quite as good as Greece. That's a fact. You, you know, you look at infant mortality rates, black women are three or four times higher infant mortality than white women. Um, you know, and yet at the same time, we're spending insane amounts of money on very small improvements in people's lifespan. We spend $100,000 to make somebody who's gonna die anyway live an extra week or two. We have to, we have to really deal with these issues. Yeah, I would like to nuke the insurance companies. Yeah, I don't, I don't like them. But, <laughs> but, you know, that's what I, I, I think Obamacare is wimpy and moderate and is going to fail for that reason. You know, it's, it's not radical enough to appease the Green Party here, and it's not, and it, you know, it's, and it costs too much to appease the radical Republicans. What are you going to do? You're going to mess everybody up. So, no, I don't like any of these plans. <laughs> Carol. I'm a single payer. Every civilized, um, industrialized country has one. My husband's Canadian. It, it makes perfect sense. If we cut out the insurance companies, we have more than enough money to cover the needs of every single person. And it, it should begin as soon as possible. Okay, William. We need universal health care and we need single payer. The problem with our health care, one of the biggest problems with our health care today is the insurance providers. The insurance providers answer to Wall Street and every three months they have to show an increase in profits. And the way they do this is by raising premiums and denying coverage. And this is just gonna go on and on and on until it's changed. And unless we change the, the, the system in Washington, D.C. and the stranglehold that corporations and special interests have on our leaders, it won't change until it collapses, until it just collapses from its own weight. All right, this, this is a question all dear to all of your hearts. So let's hear the answer to this one. <laughs> let's see, I think, Carol, it's uh, your turn to start first again. How do you see yourself, if elected, fixing the influence of money in government? Oh, thank you, that was... <laughs> If elected, <laughs> I pledge to introduce an amendment to the Constitution which would abol abolish corporate personhood, declare that money is not free speech, wow. <laughs> explicitly ban special interest money in elections. As long as m murder, war, theft by corrupt legislators is legalized, we do not have a democracy. We must demand accountability and transparency in all aspects of government. All right, Dave. Oh. I would be uh, talking to the Justice Department on a regular basis, uh, discussing people who need to be indicted. It, <laughs> it's a very long list. <laughs> I have a flyer to hand out later. Um, yeah, what can one member do? I mean, what's, what's going to happen is that this is going to be a long, drawn-out fight. We're going to have to we're going to have to take back the government one congressional race at a time, and the problem is that the other team has some really talented people. I mean, it is astonishing how some of these career politicians can lie 
just look you right in the face, say something you don't know. It's obviously false. Both of you know it's false, and they'll look you right in the eye and tell you something. Incredible talent. Not beneficial to humanity, but you know. One, what we're going to have to do is you, you pick the low-hanging fruit, and the one thing that is the most likely to get through Congress because it's the most outrageous thing is the practice of allowing foreign corporations to have lobbying groups in Washington. And my absolute least favorite foreign corporations are the Indian outsourcing firms like Infosys and Wipro. We should prevent them from having legal lobbying. Thank you. Okay, you know, William, we're going to start with you again because this is specifically addressed to you. What? Wait, he, he gets oh, he has to answer oh, the all right. One. I'm sorry. I'm jumping ahead. Yes. Uh, no. <laughs> solve this problem of influence of money. Then you get this the next hard one. Yes. Well, we can't look to Washington to solve this problem. This, there, but there is a simple solution, and it's the voters. Now, I, like I said, I've probably voted for Anna Eshoo at least eight times, and we probably agree on all of the issues, and I like what she had to say. But I also know that she's raised well over $500,000 for her reelection. It's probably up closer to a million now. 70% of that is from outside of the district. 50% of that is from outside of the state. The biggest contributors are pharmaceuticals and communications, followed by finance. Now, $30,000 back in December, she'd received $30,000 from HP. The CEO is, is, is um, Meg Whitman, who we're very familiar with her politics and her veracity for the truth. <laughs> so we must change the politicians, and they will not impose term limits, so we have to do that itself. We should do it at the primaries. If you want to keep a Democrat in, change the incumbent at the primary. If you want to keep a Republican in, change it at the primary. But we need to change the leadership in Washington, D.C. Okay, thank you. Now, this next question is, I'll direct it to you and then all of you candidates can um, you know, make a comment should you choose. What treaty did Obama sign in Colombia? That's to you, William. Well, that would be the, tra uh, the Colombian Trade Agreement. Yeah. With his recent visit during with with the uh, with the with Secret the, Service with the Secret Service scandals, <laughs> got I all read the about press. That. We didn't know why he went. Now we know. Oh dear. <laughs> That's Do we, either of you have a comment further on the Colombian? Uh, okay. The yeah. Oh, do you? Go ahead. Yeah. The the uh, the U.S. Colombia free trade agreement is probably going to cost between 30 and 50,000 American jobs. Um, that number is remarkably consistent, whether it comes from the Heritage Foundation or from the AFL-CIO. Left to right, everybody agrees this treaty is going to cost 50,000 American jobs, more or less. I, I, can I just add something, too? Yes. Sure. Um, the free trade area of the America, that was opposed by people throughout the northern hemisphere and the <laughs> southern hemisphere. And what has happened is they've been making these treaties with Chile, treaties with Panama, and all these other countries, because it's much harder to fight when it's done one treaty at the time. They manage to sneak by. It's harder to get a lot of people to mm -hmm. gather to oppose them. Um, most of these treaties are actually, the negotiations are in secret. They know that people will oppose them and be very visible. That's why they moved the G8 summit from Chicago to, to Camp David. There's a lot of opposition <laughs> to corporate rule and these, and these agreements because they're, oh. they, they harm people everywhere. If, if I could get 20 seconds for that. The U.S. trade representative is currently negotiating something called the Trans-Pacific Partnership. They choose to not call it a free trade agreement because that term seems to have gotten a bad reputation. But this is another one of these NAFTA giant ripoff free trade agreements. Okay, now this is a question to all of you, and you could, if you could try to make it um, short here. How would you feel about an audit of the Federal Reserve? And we'll start again with you, Carol. 
I think they did an audit and they were horrified by what they discovered <laughs> as to how much money was given to foreign banks. I mean, it's completely scandalous. And I, I suggest people go online and find out the astronomical figures that uh, the Fed has been passing out to foreign banks. William? Yes. <clears throat> yes, I would support a, a regular audit of the Federal Reserve. Right. And Dave? Yeah, I tend to agree with that. But much more comprehensive reform of the Fed is called for. And the opportunity is coming up. The 100th anniversary of the Fed is December of 2013. That's a, an auspicious day to make some major changes in the governance of the place. Audit should be part of that. Okay, we'll start with you, Dave, on this one. What is your position on Citizens United? the Supreme Court ruling based on corporations as people. Wow. Um, that, that's one for the history books. Uh, that, that is probably going to be 50, 100 years from now, that will be remembered as one of the worst Supreme Court decisions right up there with Dred Scott. Um, the immediate impact of it is that it's going to have to be dealt with at the constitutional amendment level. And the way I think this is going to play out is that pressure is building for a constitutional convention just like 100 years ago. And I think that when enough pressure builds up for a constitutional convention, then the, the log jams will break and we'll get some amendments dealing with these outrageous things. Carol? It reveals the corruption of the Supreme Court. If people aren't familiar with the Powell Memo in 1971, uh, please look into it. And it sort of lays out the plan in order to, for corporations to exert more power over society. They wanted to have more influence in the court and through those decisions um, empower corporations basically against people. And they've, they've held to that plan. And we've seen the Supreme Court compromise itself in, in numerous interest, interest cases uh, in favor of corporations over people. It's very scandalous. I think we should impeach a few Supreme Court justices. Uh, they, also, that decision uh, overturns a 100-year history of um, the, it, it used to be a felony for corporations to influence a, elections and for it to just ignore a hundred years of history with that decision it's just outrageous I, I I had a radio show and there was a guy who actually walked across the country to he was so he the most he had done politically before was put up a yard sign and he was so thoroughly outraged he was like 70 years old he walked across the country in protest okay and William well it's a terrible decision and but we shouldn't just shrug our shoulders and think that we need to, to amend the Constitution because even if money is speech, we can regulate speech. We can regulate time, place, and manner. Speech is regulated. So we can still regulate money, and we need to do that. But also, I know this is a, a kind of like a broken record, but this is my message. If we, have, if we impose term limits on our elected officials, they will be more interested in representing the voters than they will be in getting reelected, and they won't be catering to special interests and their money. Now I have a very easy question here for you, and I'll start with you, William. Uh, what will you do to create jobs for the 10 million unemployed? <laughs> Okay, well, I'll take that as a question about the economy. Uh, first of all, there's a lot of things that we need, need to do for the economy. We, we need a, a fair taxation system where everybody pays their share. We need to cut defense spending, and we need to stop the war in Afghanistan, and we need to end our dependency on oil. As long as we're dependent on oil, we'll never have a recovery. We started to have a recovery a few months ago. The price of gas went up and the recovery stalled. And the, it's not supply and demand. You can't drill your way out of it. Supply is regulated by OPEC, so we need to get away from oil. Now, we need, to do, we need, we need a jobs bill that rebuilds infrastructure, rebuilds schools, funds educations, teachers, firemen, 
police officers. We need to create jobs and construction on the infrastructure. Dave? Yeah, it's a tough one. I mean, the, the problem we've had so far has been that um, when Obama had that uh, stimulus bill, I think that they, most people who, who are knowledgeable about macroeconomics were of the opinion that a 4% stimulus was not going to do very much against an economy with 9% unemployment. And in the event, it didn't do much. And I remember people saying, half a loaf is better than none. Now, what I told them was, half a car won't get you anywhere. <laughs> we can create a lot of jobs in this country as long as we do two things. The first thing is that the Federal Reserve has been increasing the money supply these last 10 years in these various bailouts and, and stimulus quantitative easing programs, and it's all been in the form of debt. That's why the debt to equity ratio in every sector of the economy is at historical levels. We need to tax the Fed or have the Fed declare a dividend. It doesn't matter where it goes exactly, but it has to be in the form of equity capital rather than debt. The, the debt problem in this country can only be solved by creating equity. And in terms of, you know, putting the people to work, yeah, just, I go to the, every public school around here looks like a trailer park. It's insane. We, we've got unemployed construction workers, six, eight million of them, and we can put them to work building schools. It's very easy. Carol. We live in the wealthiest nation, yet the local, state, federal governments are facing budget crisis and cutting services. No one's been held accountable for the largest financial heist in history. The recession is an allocation problem. Less than 1% own the majority of wealth. If we took back the ill-gotten gains and required state-chartered corporations to serve the public interest, we wouldn't be in this mess. Our money system has a profound effect on our lives. Um, Steven Zarlenga, a historian of money, says, over time, whoever controls the money system controls the nation. Wall Street has privatized our money system. The big banks are licensed to print money. They issue 90% of the money supply. Is it any surprise that Wall Street runs the country? Money's value comes from society. So the way to issue money is through a government which provides real services to all and removes the national debt tax burden off the middle class and the working poor. H.R. 2990 does that. We could pay off the national debt, we can fund national health care program, close the state budget gaps, fund tuition-free higher education, provide a basic income guarantee to the unemployed, and end inflation if we take back the power to print money from the banks. We have lots of people. There's no reason we can't put them to work doing things that we need desperately. Um, we should be able to solve this problem if we solve the who creates money problem. And a debt-based system always concentrates wealth and power, destroying uh, empires in the process, usually when they wipe out their ecological base. We have to get away from that, create money as a public utility to serve us. William. Could you repeat the question, I'm, please? Um, did you, I'm sorry. Yeah, all right, I'm sorry. Then we're down to Dave. I'm sorry, I was keeping good notes here. What? I think, you're, I think you're on the next question. All right. What is your stance on the current level of funding and use of the military? And Dave, we'll start with you. Ah, yes. Well, I'm, I'm about the only Republican around here who's in favor of major defense cuts. But I'm in favor of very specific defense cuts. <clears throat> I believe that the United States Army is more or less useless from a national security point of view. But we do need a Navy. We are a natural sea power. The United States is essentially a great big island. And funny thing about land warfare is somebody can get holed up in the mountains and hold, two Boy Scouts can hold off a division in the right terrain. But there's no oceans that have hills in them. <laughs> the US Navy, we need to spend more money on the Navy especially on unmanned aerial platforms and certain other platforms. And we need to continue to maintain superiority in Air Force, space, and cyber warfare assets. But the Army should be stabilized at about 20% of its current staffing levels. 
We began World War II with 200,000 men in the Army, and we won. We began the Vietnam War with two million guys in the Army, and we lost. There is no evidence that a large peacetime military is beneficial when the bullets start to fly. In fact, the evidence is that the sort of person who becomes a middle-ranking officer in a peacetime military is the last guy you want running the thing when there's a war on. Carol? I, I think the military budget is obscene, and we need to redirect all those resources and that human intellectual power towards solving the real problems that humanity faces at this time. Uh, we definitely need to cut the military budget, especially things like the no, uh, the cost overrun programs like Halliburton. What they did in <laughs> Iraq is absolutely scandalous. Uh, we need to redirect our, our resources to improving the health, improving the environment, not destroying the planet, threatening people, robbing them of their resources. Okay, and William. 50% of our tax revenue goes to defense, 2% goes to education. And 40% 40, 40 of those tax dollars going for defense is borrowed money. So this is it's undermining the stability of our country more than it is adding to the stability of this country. We need to stop the military madness that has gripped this country, and we need to stop the influence that the military industrial complex has on Washington, D.C. All right, this next question addresses transportation. Uh, funding for public transportation is limited. How do you feel about greater emphasis on public transit? And we'll start with Carol. I think we should have a better public transportation structure. And uh, there's, there's many cities which have modeled transportation systems that we could learn from. It's a shame that um, the the, the system in Los Angeles was destroyed by our automobile companies <laughs> in collusion with one another, and they forced uh, us all into cars and onto the highways. Um, I think we need to reclaim the streets so that we actually have a decent public transportation system and try to reduce the cars. Okay, Dave. Well, I'd like to start by saying that I think the high-speed rail proposal is an idiotic waste of money. I've said it before, I'll probably say it again. From a general point of view, rubber wheel transport is more flexible and seems to be cheaper than steel wheel transport and is back to the future idea that we're going to go put up railroad tracks all over the place is, is just not going to work out. The best public transit system I personally have ever seen was in Bogota, Colombia. Uh, people who have been there say that Sao Paulo, Brazil, has the best public transport system in the world. Both of these are based upon rubber-wheeled vehicles. The system in Colombia relies on a mixture of buses, colectivos, and taxis. A colectivo is a minibus. For the United States, the, the most immediately useful thing we could do is to legalize jitneys. You know, we used to have a system where people would would drive in a minivan and they'd go to like a bus stop and pick people up, charge them five bucks. The practical result of jitney buses is that these are, these are people who are acting as part-time bus drivers and a little more organized than a carpool, but they only are doing it during rush hour, which is of course when you really need to get people out of their individual cars. So I've legalized jitneys. We need mass transit. We need to reduce our carbon footprint, and we need to get off of oil. And so we need to invest in all types of mass transit. Uh, clean, efficient biodiesel buses. I, I, think, I think we would, would benefit from a, from a high-speed train in California, and I, and I hope that goes through. Uh, we need to do anything we can to get, uh, to get off of oil. All right, this question is, do you support a woman's right to choose health and reproductive choices? And Dave, we'll start with you. Yes. <laughs> it's none of the government's business. 
You know, we over at the Republican Party occasionally have discussions of the form. Can we throw that guy out of the party? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to name names, <laughs> but a lot of them live in Virginia. <laughs> uh, William? Um, I, I support a, a woman's right to choose, and, and this is being threatened from the right, and, and not just the right to choose, but also repro reproductive rights and birth control. And it's, it's a very important issue, and we need to do everything we can to protect a woman's rights to choose. And Carol. Yes, definitely. All right, here's another very easy one. Uh, what would you like to do about climate change? And Carol, we'll start with you. I, I think we have to do everything we can to rein in the oil industry as well as the nuclear industry and put most of our resources towards renewables. I also think we need to reform our patent system because our patent system has been repressing technologies which could solve a lot of our energy needs and uh, other, other countries can leapfrog over the United States because of the strength of the nuclear industry and the oil industry in this country so that we can't actually access a lot of these technologies just because of the, of, of the patent system. It's so um, prohibitive for really innovative technologies. Okay, Dave? Hmm. Well, I, I, I'm not a fan of nuclear power. I think that trading in carbon dioxide emissions for um, radon, krypton, and xenon emissions is a poor trade-in. What we need to do at the end of the day is we need to have a carbon tax. And I know that this is politically very, very difficult, but the proposed cap-and-trade is a fiasco. It's a big scam, and it's not going to work. And the proposed cap-and-trade is – it. It's just one of these things where it's designed to create the appearance, oh, yes, we care about climate change. But as a practical matter, if you had a carbon tax, what would happen is that coal use would drop dramatically, oil use would stay the same, and natural gas use would increase. That, but a carbon tax is the way to do it. Use market principles. The, the command and control approach to the, will not work either. And, you know, right now you look at the amount of foot dragging that we're having over just very common sense regulations. The United Nations keeps having these things, and yet India is subsidizing kerosene and diesel fuel for its lots of poor people over there. Various third world countries are subsidizing their population consuming petroleum products. You know, it's not just the United States. We need to have an international treaty prohibiting these kind of subsidies. All right, and William. Climate change is a real problem. We need to do everything we can to reduce our carbon footprint. Solar on every roof and electric in every garage would be a good start. But we must come up with renewable energy and, and re uh, sustainable resources and, and, and stop using petroleum products. All right. These get easier and easier. Uh, <laughs> what do you think about expanding Medicare to cover all? Medicare is already in place. And we'll start with William. I think that's a great idea. And I think one way we can start is by allowing a buy-in for people, say, from 50, 55 up to 65. Let them buy in to the program. Or it might even be better to, to start at 45, because at 45, I think, you know, if you notice in Silicon Valley, the workforce is younger and younger and younger, and it stays younger. And the reason it's going to stay young is because a major cost of, of, of the employers is the cost of medical insurance. And what determines the cost of the medical insurance is the age of the employee. And I, I just know this has to be having influence on the workforce. Now, if you, ha if you, if a 45-year-old man or woman could buy into Medicare, 
then they could go out and take a job that didn't require health insurance. This would help the employer, and this would, would help, would, would help the, the workforce. And in addition, Medicare is working. It's a single pay, payer program that is working. So we need to start expanding these. We also need to expand uh, veterans, the Veterans Administration that uh, we should let VA's uh, veterans' families buy in also. Carol, I think single payer would be superior, but if we couldn't get single payer, I could see expanding Medicare to reach more people. Also, I think Congress has a fairly decent health care program, and that could be expanded greatly. That would probably be a good solution. I don't think that was the question. <laughs> Dave. Well, the mem members of Congress uh, as, as a group are healthier than the average American. You have to be to co go to all these meetings. Um, yeah, I, expanding Medicare is, is attractive, although re the reality is that you're not going to, people aren't going to buy into it. It's going to be a gift from above. It's the only way it'll happen. Um, but Medicare, there have been a lot of problems over the years with Medicare. For example, it, when it was started in the 1960s, Sonoma County and Santa Cruz County were both identified as low cost of living areas. And Medicare reimbursements in those places was at 85% of the national standard reimbursement. It was like pulling teeth. <laughs> it was like pulling teeth to get the federal government to finally, I think they only did it about 12, 15 years ago, to finally admit that Santa Cruz County is not a low cost of living area. I mean, I don't know what their problem was. It is very difficult if you're on Medicare. Now, somebody correct me, but, but, but my understanding is that to find a doctor who will take new Medicare patients in the Bay Area, yeah. And this is because the Medicare reimbursements are set at the national level, but in the Bay Area, the cost of living is substantially higher. And as a result, you've got a lot of doctors around here, probably more than half of them, who are refusing to take new Medicare patients. I, I don't think it's a panacea. Thank you. What is your position, and this is very timely if you followed the news today, uh, what's your position on bringing back Wall Street, but mostly banking reg regulations? And uh, William, we'll start with you. Absolutely, and that's our biggest problem. And we need to do something, we need to do something immediately. Yes, we need to bring back Glass-Siegel. We need to do whatever we can to control Wall Street and the banks. And, and what J.P. Morgan Chase announced today is a perfect example of the problem. They announced that there was a two, $2 billion loss because of risky investments. So we, we can't let the investment banks and, and, the, and, and the regular banks combine together. This is the problem that we have. So we need to, we need to separate that out and we need to regulate. And also, we need, you know, hopefully someone will ask a question about the foreclosure problem, because this problem was caused by the banks and the government giving the deregulation that they wanted that allowed the banks and the lenders give the subprime loans to people who were never qualified at reduced interest for the first few years. And this was unsustainable, and it had to end the way it did. And now what's even worse is the 80% of the foreclosures are illegal. They haven't followed the state law. This needs to be stopped. This could be stopped. It could be stopped by the district attorneys in every county. And as a congressperson, that's the first thing I would do is I would insist that the district attorneys start cases based on fair business practice, stop these illegal foreclosures, and insist on fair Mo uh, modifications for home loans for the owners that let them stay in the homes. Dave. Wow. This is where the rubber meets the road in terms of corruption, folks. Here's the deal. Fraud was committed. Big time fraud. You may have seen the amusing hearings with Senator Schumer in which I believe the term dog turd was bandied about as we have the email servers these clowns were using to send 
their emails back and forth. We have tens of thousands of documents from Moody's, Fisk, Standard & Poor's going back to, you know, Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers, Morgan Stanley. As part of the Federal Reserve's investigation five, six years ago, they went down there, a bunch of guys with guns and business suits, and they snagged all the backup tapes. We have the evidence. This is not hypothetical. People accepted bribes, people at the rating agencies, to give AAA ratings to various credit default obligation securities that they were privately describing in R-rated language. And the Obama administration has been running out the clock on these people. The Obama administration's failure to indict any of these guys means that not only will most of them escape prosecution through the statute of limitations, but they will get to keep the money. Eric Holder's Justice Department is a bordello. They are corrupt to the core, and this is the proof of it. Carol. For anyone who hasn't seen the documentary Inside Job, I highly recommend it. It shows the complete criminalization of our financial industry. William Black uh, helped to recover some of the money stolen in the savings and loan debacle during the 80s. There has been nobody um, trying to prosecute those who have committed horrific control fraud in the wake of the, the recent crisis. Um, the, the crooks are writing the rules and changing the rules and t taking as much money as they can in the process in the most flagrant way. Uh, we, we need to have some accountability. We need to recover some of the money. And these people should be prosecuted. Uh, we, Glass-Steagall is like the mildest reform. If we reinstate <laughs> that, that would be a help. But in some ways, the whole speculative realm is, is, is aiding and abetting fraud. That's all there is to it. <laughs> all right, this uh, question revolves around dependence on oil. Would you support a requirement that all oil from the United States government areas are refined and used in the United States? Dave, we'll start with you. No. That's one of those stupid feel-good laws. We, we actually are gaining a certain amount of strategic leverage over people like Venezuela because they do not have the ability to refine their own oil. <clears throat> so Venezuela has no ability to embargo us of crude oil because we would be very easily able to embargo them on uh, refined products. It's ironic when you think about it. We import 3 billion barrels of oil into this country every year, more or less. We are currently paying $300 billion a year for that oil. That is a major contributing factor to our trade deficit. Use the market. Do not pass silly laws and then make believe law enforcement tax it. We are paying $120 billion a year for Central Command operation. Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Qatar, Doha, Kuwait, Diego Garcia, $120 billion a year, and oh yes, young men coming home in body bags. Pay at the pump, folks. If we're importing 3 billion barrels of oil and we're paying $120 billion a year, the math is we should have a $40 a tax, $40 a barrel tax on imported oil. That is what I'm in favor of. Carol. Yeah, he, he's right. And the oil industry is completely subsidized by our military. Uh, not only that, but the oil itself is very toxic to all life. It should stay in the ground. We really need to get off of oil and to go for renewables. Um, I, I don't know the exact mechanisms to do it, whether that law that you suggested where we only consume the oil in this country would be a benefit. I do know that in California, 
the oil companies are taking a lot of money and they're not paying for any of the harm or the damage that they cause. And this is the case in almost every place where the oil companies are extracting oil and, uh, and the, the people in those environments are paying the, the, the cost. What happened in the Gulf of Mexico is obscene and what um, Obama did to help the oil companies and deny the, the, the toxicity of the seafood in the Gulf of Oil and to push that on the American people, I, th I think it was ter horrific. We, we need to recognize how bad oil is for the air, for the environment, for all life, and to get off of it as soon as possible and to build the infrastructure so we can go to renewables or, or reduce our consumption. Okay, and William. I would support a tax on, on oil coming in. I know that the question was, would I support an embargo to, to no, domestic? Would, uh, yeah, would you support a requirement that all oil from U.S. government areas are refined and used in the United States? I think domestic oil should stay domestic. And I certainly don't think we should take a Canadian um, oil sand and ship, you know, pipe it across the country, refine it in Houston, and then ship it to China. Or France. Or France. <laughs> That's the wrong thing to do. And it, so increasing that supply is not going worldwide. It's not going to affect the price of oil here. So I would support the tax. I would support the embargo. And we do need to do everything we can to reduce our dependency. Thank you. How are we coming? Okay, well, let me give one last question here, as best as I can read that. This. Some of you are going to get <coughs> English writing lessons after this. <laughs> Please provide specific examples of foreign governments control corrupting our legislators. And we will start with William. Well, I'd have to think about that for a minute. Specific. Well, I think I think well certainly the lobbyists, you know, all, all countries can lobby here and they can and they can uh, donate to campaigns and that needs to be stopped. And I don't know any specific ones, but since this is the last question, let me go off that question for a minute and say that in addition to the things we've talked about. I also want to say that we need to repeal the National Defense Administration Wait, Act. Just a minute. You will have a closing oh, okay. summary. Right. Don't, I'm not taking much. that away from you. This is just the last question, so let's... Uh... Okay, so I can't think of any specific examples of okay. that. Okay, that's right. Uh, Dave, any specific examples? Yeah, in 1991, the Emir of Kuwait spent $100 million hiring half of the lobbyists in Washington, and he bought himself a war. You may have heard about it. We liberated Kuwait. During the second Bush administration, the government of India paid a large amount of money to various politicians in the U.S. Senate and in the executive branch, which resulted in something called the U.S.-India nuclear deal. In addition to being a violation of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, this treaty basically boils down to the United States government selling the Indian government nuclear weapon components. This is so completely not in the U.S. national interest, I cannot describe it to you. Large amounts of money exchange hands. Haley Barber received $1.2 million from front groups representing the Indian government in his race to become the uh, governor of Mississippi. Anna Eshu has received money from various Indian corporations, including Infosys, Wipro, Tata, or more accurately, their subsidiary, Tata Consulting Service, and I believe HCL. It is my opinion that Anna Eshu receiving money from these Indian corporations is the reason why she has been so supportive of the continued importation of cheap slave labor by Silicon Valley corporations. I believe that Anna Eshu has betrayed a million American families for $5 a piece. She received $5 million in campaign contributions over the last 12 years, and at the same time, 1.1 million American jobs, good jobs, jobs that require a college degree were lost. She sold out American college graduates for $5 a piece. 
There's your example. Carol. Uh, Bandar Bush, who was Prince Bandar, um, I became a member of the Bush family, and I know that that Saudi influence had a great um, effect on the, the Bush family and their policies. Just one example. Thank you all. And at this time, I'd like to um, conclude this question period and ask each of you to give a one-minute summary statement. And we'll work backwards. So, Dave, we will start with you. Well, with, with all due respect, um, I'm afraid my colleagues here, in the event that they were elected, would find themselves in the unpleasant position of being a freshman congressman in the minority party. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> if, if I'm in there, I would at least have the advantage of being able to get my own committee assignments, maybe even a good parking space, who knows. The situation in America right now demands that it's not good enough to have members of the Democratic Party advocating policies to deal with global warming, to reduce our excess military spending, et cetera. You have to have a two-party system if you want to get anywhere. And the major difference between where I'm coming from and where the Green Party is coming from is that I believe that taxes on pollution are the way to go, not regulations. But I think we all agree that it is not in the U.S. national interest to have the sea levels rise 30 feet. So that's why you should vote for me. And oh, yes, you should vote against Anna Eshoo. <laughs> William? Okay, I think we've, uh, I th you know, excellent questions. I do think we've covered all the majority of all the topics. The few things that I want to add is that I, I support marriage equality. I think this is long overdue, and I think this needs to come about nationwide. I, and I support all rights for uh, the gay, lesbian, transgender uh, communities. And we need to repeal the NDAA, the National Defense Authorization Act, and we need, and we need to protect the environment. Thank you. Uh, Carol? I ran for Congress to raise a taboo topic back in 2006, and since then I've been shocked at the continuity of government between the Republican and Democratic administrations as they have perpetuated a war economy, attacked all human rights, and facilitated a global heist. I was greatly inspired and energized last fall when my son and I participated in Occupy Chicago, Occupy DC, and Occupy Wall Street to witness people across generations coming together in solidarity with a global movement to champion the vast majority over the few. As an organizer, I know how much time and effort goes into events and rallies, and it's heartening for me to witness the depth and breadth of a global political awakening. The American empire cannot coexist with American democracy. It's our responsibility, our moral duty, to reclaim our democracy. To restore democracy, we need to change the rules. We can overturn the Patriot Act, the NDAA, outlaw torture, rein in corporate power, take back the power to create money from banks. We can hold our government officials accountable, revoke corporate personhood, get money corporate money out of elections and create a new foreign policy driven by respect for human dignity. I invite you all to walk the precincts with me and vote for me. Together we can occupy Congress. All right, can we clap for all of them, please? At this time, I'd also like all of the League of Women Voters, please, who have helped on this uh, panel tonight, could they all stand so we could clap for them? Oh, yeah. Yes, there you go. Thank you very much, and thank you for coming this evening.